Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for at attending this session. Uh, so welcome to Docker for Developers track. And for this session, we have a speaker who is a Microsoft MVP author, frequent speaker at conference, user group, and community events. He's a developer with experience around ASP.NET and Node and Angular. So he's here to talk about another interesting topic uh, on basic of uh, Windows containers and getting started with Docker desktop integration with Visual Studio to build .NET Core apps. So please welcome Rob Richardson onto the stage. Thank you. So uh, they asked me to build a deck for today's presentation. Um, I like demos better, so that's my deck. Thanks, everyone, for coming. No, I'm just kidding. So here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides on my blog tonight. You're going to check on my site tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month. Has that ever worked out? So. In about three months, you're going to get tired of waiting. In about six, you're going to email me. In about six months, I'll reply and I'll say, no, I'm definitely going to post them on my site tonight. And I will never post them ever. Which is why you can go to my site right now, robrich.org. You can click on presentations and you can grab the code that we're about to build right now. So head off to robrich.org, click on presentations, and then click on the code right here. While you're here, you can pull up the About Me page. And this is some of the things that I've done recently. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm a Microsoft MVP, a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is wonderful. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities who otherwise couldn't afford software services. We start building software for them Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software back to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us because AZ Give Camp is a lot of fun. Some of the other things that I've done, uh, one of the things I'm particularly proud of is uh, I replied to a .NET Rocks episode. They read my comment on the air. They sent me a mug. Woohoo! OK, so we're here to talk about Docker on Windows. And usually in Windows in .NET, we're either working in .NET Framework or we're working in .NET Core. So let's start with a .NET Framework application. and We'll just say file, new project. I'm here in Visual Studio 2017. I'll grab a .NET Framework application. I'll put it here, and let's call this .NET Framework, Framework App. OK, so we have our .NET application. And with a .NET application, we probably have a back-end service that's going to do interesting things. So once we get our .NET Framework application here in place, let's also create a Windows service. Let's add a new project. And this will also be .NET Framework. And we'll go grab a Windows service. Windows service 1, that sounds perfect. So right now, our Windows service doesn't do anything. Let's make it do something interesting. I will view code here. And let's do something like every few minutes, or every few seconds, it will trigger and kick off a thing. So I'll create a timer. And let's use system.timers. This timer, we will start out with it not enabled. And we will kick it off every, eh, let's say, 500 milliseconds. When it kicks off, elapsed, we will do this. So throwing an exception is probably a bad idea. Console.write line. Let's fill up the logs. Elapsed. Date time dot now dot to. OK, so our service is now doing something interesting. And now when we start our service, Let's turn on our timer. And when we stop our service, we will turn off our timer. OK, so now we've got our front end website. We've got our back end service. And let's Dockerize this. So step one is, oh, dispose. 
Step one is each, uh, one of the rules of thumb of Docker is that one container is one process. So as we look at the solution, we will have two containers, one for our website and one for our service. Another good rule of thumb is that Docker is gonna monitor that one process, and if anything happens in that process, if the process stops, if it becomes unhealthy, then Docker will know to evict that container and start up a new one. So right now here in our service, we've got this mechanism that will kick it up as a Windows service. We really want that process to be live in our Docker container. So let's rip out the servicey bits from our service. We will remove the base class. Now it is no longer overriding things. So we'll just go with a public void. And now we have a service that will run uh, on our process. Well, let's carry that through here into program.cs. So we start up our service and enable, enable our service by starting it there. We'll take in the command line parameters and pass that off to our service if we need to. And now Docker is gonna to wanna to monitor that process and make sure that it stays alive. So let's do something like keeping our process alive. And this just ensures that our process is alive, our timer will now continue kicking off, and now we're ready to do all the things. Every 500 milliseconds, that timer will, will launch and it will do the work. Is this draining a queue? Is this sending all the emails? Now we have a process that's ready to dockerize. So let's start off and let's add a new empty file. Now it's important here that this file be called dockerfile, not dockerfile.txt, which is really easy to do by the way. I haven't made that mistake in, uh, I don't know, an hour. But it's actually called Dockerfile. So we'll create this Dockerfile, and now we'll start and we'll say from .NET. We really wanna start with this .NET base image and build up this container. So let's head off to Docker Hub, and we'll take a look at, uh, we'll search for .NET Framework. Let's pull up the .NET Framework page, and let's look at some of the repos that we have available. We have the SDK, we have ASP.NET, runtime. There's a cool samples repo that is really nice. Oh, the SDK repo looks exactly like what we wanna do. We wanna build inside of our container, so let's start there. I'll pop open that page, and scrolling down a little bit, here's that image that we wanna drive from, the .NET Framework SDK. This is a .NET Framework 4.8 project, so we'll start with that one. And now let's copy in all of our source from the current directory to the target directory inside the container. Well, where is that target directory? Let's make it the source directory inside of, inside of our image. Okay, so we wanna copy in all the content, then we'll run MS build, uh, build uh, dash p, configuration equals release. We want to build in um, release mode, not in debug mode. And let's run on as many processors as we have available. So we've copied in our source code. Well, before we can uh, build it, we'll need to run NuGet restore. That'll pull in all of our packages. So we've got NuGet restore, and then we build but now we're restoring all of our packages every time. Let's take advantage of Docker caching to cache those layers so that we can only restore the packages when we need to. Let's move this above this copy line. We'll say this is restore dependencies, and this will be build. Before we do that NuGet restore, let's copy in net framework app.sln into the current directory. Let's copy web application one dot csproj into web application one 
csproj. We'll also copy in Windows Service One, Windows Service One dot csproj into place, and we'll also copy in all of the package configs. So now we're restoring dependencies, and now because of caching, if I only change the rest of my application, I change a .cs file or a .cshtml file, I won't need to re-download all of my, my NuGet dependencies. I have this faster inner loop. That's perfect. Okay, so build, we might want to test. So here's where we would do something like run NuGet, uh, not NuGet, um, nUnit, Dot exe, passing in all the parameters. In this case, we don't have any tests, so we'll just skip that part. And then we want to publish it, so we'll do something like run x copy slash src slash Windows service one bin release star dot star into this, eh, let's call it an app folder. Okay, work dir is slash app, and the command to start it up. Windows service one.exe. Okay, we've got a production uh, build file. This will work just fine. But this Docker file is gonna do things like um, deploying the build tools, deploying our source code. Maybe, let's see if I can get our production image down a little bit by creating a second stage. Back here at Docker Hub, Let's go look for the other things. Oh, hey, there's a .NET Framework runtime. That'll be perfect for our console app. Let's go dig into that one, and we've got this base image right here. So right here, let's create a new stage. There's that one, and now as I copy, I'm not gonna run x copy. I'm gonna instead copy slash src slash. Windows service one bin release into the current folder. Well, I'm not copying it from my host machine, I'm copying it from this other image that we built up here. So let's say dash dash from equals build and we'll tag this one as build. Perfect. So now we have that first stage that will kind of act as our, for lack of a better term, build server. And we have the second stage that will act as our production runtime. Now we still want our build server to build this. We don't want to um, start building it for random places. But now we have a production runtime image that will be really, really small. We have our service that is now a console app. We've built that into a Docker file. This copy is gonna copy everything. And that may not be what we want. Inside Visual Studio, it's probably gonna do a build, so we'll have a bin and an obj folder. So let's come into this folder, and we will add a new empty file. And this file will be called .dockerignore. Now this docker ignore file with that leading dot is really hard to create in Windows. But that docker ignore file is not that unlike a git ignore file. That git ignore file specifying all the things that I don't want to commit in my repository, the docker ignore file is all the things I don't want to copy into my image when I say copy everything. bin obj packages star dot or dot vs dot vs code dot idea star.user, star.suo, star.log. Stop me when you get to the part where uh, we've ignored all kinds of things. So if we don't have a docker ignore file, it will actually look for that git ignore file. If we do have a docker ignore file, it'll just take this one and it won't like combine them together. But now with this docker ignore file, now we're specifying I don't want you to copy in all of these things. I want you instead to build them inside the container as you're getting ready to build this image. We've got our service as a process. We've got our Docker ignore file. We've got our Docker file. So now let's go build it. 
Docker build. Now here we are in the net framework app folder next to the solution, but our Docker file is next to the project. Now that's okay, we're building the Windows service project, but here when we say Docker build, we'll have to tell it where that file is. So it's in Windows Service 1 Docker file. That's perfect. And let's tag this image on the way out, net framework service. And we'll give it a build context. What should be the current directory as it kicks off outside the container? Let's say the current directory. Now we're ready to build, and let's kick that off. And that's gonna take way too long, so I'm just gonna break out of that. And Docker image list, we can see the net framework service that we just built. Reaching into the oven and pulling out the baked cake. We've got that image that is now built with our Windows service set inside of it. Okay, let's run it. Docker run that image. Now it's gonna JIT the .NET code, and once it JITs it, then we'll start to see the console output associated with this application. So here's that console log where we said, well, every 500 milliseconds, output that to the console. 53, 54. I'm gonna break out of this Docker container list. We can now see that's the container that we launched. I'm gonna grab the first few characters of the hash, just something to make it unique. Docker logs, that uh, image name, and we can see that we still get all of the console logs. 1613, 1616, we're doing just fine. We were able to take that Windows service and put it in a Docker image and then run that as a container inside Windows. Let's do the same thing with our website. I'm gonna grab that Docker file, or the docker ignore file, set that in place. I'll grab the docker file, set that in place. And now with this new docker file, in the old one we were building the Windows service, in the new one let's build a website. So back on Docker Hub, let's go look for, right now we were basing this on the .NET Framework runtime. In this case, let's base it on the ASP.NET website template. This has IIS baked into it and all of the details associated with IIS. So let's go to that page and we will grab that base tag. And so we will base it on this container instead. We now have IIS pre-installed. Our work directory now is C, inet pub, ww root. Perfect. There's one more step that we need to do though. We're copying the content from build into that current release, but it's not right here. We're grabbing the web application one. So that web application one, we're gonna need to go grab the, we're gonna need to publish it. So, Here's that publish step. Just so you don't need to watch me type it. That publish step will build that particular CS proj file, calling configuration release and build with all CPUs, and then also say deploy on build equals true, so that it will do the publish step associated with that. It's gonna very specifically publish based on this folder profile. So let's go create that folder profile. I'm gonna right click here and publish. Of all the publish mechanisms, folder is the one that I'm after in this case. Bin release publish is perfect, and I'm not gonna say publish immediately, but rather create profile. I'm gonna create that profile, and now here in properties publish profile, I now have that folder profile that describes how to publish that website. Now because I'm copying everything, I'll copy in this file too, and that's perfect. So that when I get to this stage in the Docker file, now I'll use that folder profile to be able to publish this application into that bin release publish folder. Now I'm copying it from bin release publish into my current folder, which happens to be C inet pub www root. So IIS is gonna pick that up automatically as its default website. And the launch command is in the base image. So 
So we don't actually even have to specify a CMD in this case. That's awesome. We've got our Docker file. We've got our Docker ignore file. Our site is ready to go. Back here on the Docker command line, Docker build file equals web application one Docker file. Because it's not at the solution level where our current directory is, but rather it's in that website. So let's go grab the Docker file from there. Dash dash tag. Let's call this uh, net framework site and our current build context of dot. So we'll kick that off and of course that's going to take too long as well. So there is the built site, net framework site. Awesome. So we've got our image now. Let's kick that off. Docker run. Now we do want to expose some inbound ports through the Docker router. Just like any router, we can map things to unusual ports. So, you know, as we're setting up our router, we forward port 3390 to 3390, 3389, because nobody's going to guess that 3389.0 is the RDP port. Let's do that here. Port 80 on my machine is already occupied. So I'm going to say I'm going to map port 3000 on my machine to port 80 inside the container. I'll run in detached mode or daemon mode. And let's kick off that container. So now I have a second container running. That's awesome. Docker container list shows both of those containers. And I will fire up a new browser. And once it takes a minute to JIT, we will see that website published. Any questions so far? Yeah. Did I stop the first container? I did not. It's still running. Let's prove that to ourselves because that's really interesting. Docker container list. It's been running for six minutes. And if we want to, we can take a look at those logs again. Docker container, or Docker logs. And we see that it's still going. It's got a bit, bit of a console log now. But yeah, it's still going. And here's our .NET Framework website. What is the build operating system? I'm building on Windows. I'm building in Windows containers at this point. So we got a .NET Framework app. Let's do that with .NET Core as well. So I'm here inside Visual Studio 2019 in this case. I could have used 2019 for the other example. I could use 2017 for this example. But let's use Visual Studio 2019. ASP.NET Core Web Application. I will call it Net Core App. Building it in the Docker Con folder. That's perfect. Create. And now we have this really interesting checkbox right here. Enable Docker support. Yeah, I breezed right past it in Visual Studio 2017, but it was there too. I have here the ASP.NET workload installed. I have the .NET Core workload installed. And I have Docker Desktop. And so that lights up this option where I can choose whether I'd like to run it on Windows containers or on Linux containers. Now, I do need to match the configuration inside Docker Desktop, but I'm in Windows mode right now, so let's build a Windows container. And we will build an MVC site. Perfect. We've got our .NET Core website. Let's go build our .NET Core Windows service. Add new project. Now, last time we needed to go through that process of making the service into a console app. So let's just straight, start straight away with a console app in this case. We can still call it Windows Service 1. And we will create it. So our Windows service, again, is completely empty. So let's go create a task that it can do. We will add a new class. And we will call this something really good like service one. <laughs> and let's go grab the code for service one just because typing all that is kind of intense. 
And here's our service one. We have that same timer mechanism. Every 500 milliseconds, it'll kick off, and it'll dump console output to the logs, which is perfect. We have this on start that will take our uh, command line arguments and kick off that service. So over here, let's go grab that. Var service equals new service one. Service dot on start will pass in the args. Maybe we passed in command line flags that will help our service do interesting things, turn on and off features or whatever. We need to keep our thread running as well. And we've got our console app ready to go. Now we added Docker support as we created the website, but in the Windows application, in the console app, we didn't have that option. So let's do this. Let's right click on that project. Let's say add, and let's choose Docker support. I have the Docker desktop, I have the .NET Core and the ASP.NET workloads, so Docker support just pops up, which is perfect. I'm adding Docker support. I get to choose my OS again, Windows or Linux. Let's choose Windows, because we're on Windows containers right now. I could just as easily flip that to Linux and now deploy it to my Kubernetes cluster as well. So we have this Docker file. It's arguably a little bit more complicated. <laughs> I wish it wasn't this many layers of indirection, but I kind of get why they went there. So, there's a Docker file. It works completely fine. We have our Docker file associated with the website, and it works completely fine as well. It's using Kestrel in this case rather than ASP. Or rather than IS. Actually, no, because it's um, no, it is. It's running Kestrel because it kicks off the .NET web application. So we don't even need IIS installed in this case, which is really neat. We're now on Nano Server. The docker ignore file is actually here inside of our directory, right next to our solution, and that's totally fine. As we build, it will go reach up through the directories until it finds it. So one docker ignore file in the root of our solution is probably perfect. In our Visual Studio 2017 solution, we probably should have done that as well, moved that docker file up to the root instead of creating duplicate copies of it. Now here in this app, we could just start the containers again, docker build, docker run, docker I've forgotten what argument we need to run. So let's instead build a docker compose file. I'm gonna add a new item, this text file that will be called docker compose.yaml. YAML is one of those wonderful and awful things YAML's white space significant, so you get two spaces. Not four spaces, not tabs, two spaces. Why two spaces? Because Google said so. Okay, so here's our YAML file. Let's go grab our Docker Compose file and set that into place. This Docker Compose file says that um, we have a list of services associated with our application. We have, in this case, a website, a Windows service. The website is gonna launch uh, map port 3000 back to port 80. Here's that build context, the dot that we had in the build file. Here's where our Docker file is. So we've got all of the pieces that we had in our build and run details, but now we have one thing that just does all of the things for us. Now that's great. Port 3000 is currently in use though, so container list. Let's go remove the old containers, net framework site. And the net framework service. And then let's say docker compose up. Now the cool thing about Docker Compose Up is it will go look through my Docker image list, see if those container, if those images already exist. If not, it will use those build details there in that Docker Compose file to build those images, and it will fire up both pieces. Ah, helps if I'm in the right directory. 
Okay, now let's Docker compose up. Now the one caveat here is that it doesn't validate that the images are up to date. So I'll typically do a Docker compose build and end Docker compose up. But in this case, we just did a Docker compose up using the images that we built previously. And we see that not only do we have the console output from our Windows service, we also have the console output from our website. So we know that we mapped port 3000 to port 80. Let's come back here and refresh our port 3000. And we now have our .NET Core app running inside of a container. Any questions so far? Yep. So I see you got backslashes. Yeah, what's with the slashes? They're going the wrong way, right? Docker really likes the forward slashes. I could use backslashes both in my Docker file and in the command line, but if I choose to use backslashes in my Docker file, I will need to escape that backslash. So I would need my backslash, and then I would need a second backslash. I like typing less, so I use forward slash. That was a great question, thank you. What other questions do you have right here? Yep. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. That's a great question. How do we debug these things? I've got them in the container and that works great in production, but I want this tight inner loop. I wanna be able to like debug stuff. Well, here inside Visual Studio, right here up at the top, my debug button, my play button, that says Docker, that's cool. I could still choose to debug inside of IS Express or inside of Kestrel, but in this case, if I choose Docker, I can debug inside the container. Let's do that. I'm gonna docker compose down. That removes all those old things. And then here inside my website, um, inside the controllers, let's set a breakpoint right here in our home controller, and let's start debugging this website. Now my website is my startup project, but I could have just as easily say start up both projects and set breakpoints in both places. That's really interesting. What we can look at right here, oh, it went away too fast. Those commands that the build is actually executing are Docker commands. This isn't Microsoft brand Docker, it's actually kicking off Docker command line utilities to build our image. As part of that image, it's gonna go download VSDebug, which is that Visual Studio remote debugger piece. It's gonna kick off a, a Docker image, or kick off a Docker container, and we've got our breakpoint. So the cool thing is I can start looking around at the local variables. I can um, start futzing with my code. I can uh, set change variables using the immediate window or directly. I have that same really tight inner loop, but I'm just gonna push play so the website shows up. But if we look at the container, we're now looking at this remote debugger container. That website that we launched inside Visual Studio is running inside of Docker and we've remote connected to it. We get that same rich debugging experience inside Visual Studio. It is gorgeous. Did that answer your question? Score. Visual Studio 2017 as well or Good question. Can I debug inside 2017 and 2019? Yes, you, yes I can. It works in both. I do need 2017 or above. I can't do this in 2015. But I could also do interesting tricks inside VS Code as well. Any other questions? Good call. Do we have to launch it with the play button here? Um, we could do some interesting things inside Visual Studio to um, attach to a process 
and we then attach to the process running in a container that we started previously. That's how it works inside VS Code. Uh, that's kind of confusing. I just like pushing the go button. But if you want to hook into a current container that's running out there, you can do the same thing. Right. If I want to hook into a container that's already running, then I just say attach to process, and I go hook into that container using either port forwarding inside of my thing or um, if it's running locally, then I can just attach to that process. You're right. Can you talk more about the caching? Can I talk more about the caching? Yes. That is really cool. Here inside this Docker file, we did these two different processes. Now up here, uh, here we will copy in everything. Well, everything that isn't part of our Docker ignore file. And so that's all of our CS files, all of our CS uh, HTML files, all of our CS proj files and solution files as well. And if we were then to run NuGet restore right here, anytime we had a change in any of our CS files, we would re-download all of our NuGet packages. Now that's okay, that works, but I'd like a faster inner loop. So I'm going to move this NuGet restore above the copy stage and then just copy in all of the manifest details, all of the CS proj files and SLN files and packages.config files that I need to be able to do a NuGet restore. So each one of these commands will create a new layer in my image. You know when you do a Docker pull and you see that it's downloading about like four or eight or ten things? Each one of those is the layer. So here I'm taking advantage of that layering concept to copy in all of my dependencies, then NuGet restore all of my libraries, and that way if I only change a .cs file, I don't need to re-download my NuGet packages. I'm going to take advantage of Docker caching this layer to be able to just continue on. Now, if I go change my .cs proj file by adding a new NuGet package reference or adding another um, changing a dependency, then that will invalidate this cache, this layer in my Docker file. Therefore, then it will copy in the new CS proj files, the new package configs. It will rerun NuGet restore, and I will get those new dependencies as well. But if I'm only changing a little piece on my website, I probably don't want to wait for that NuGet restore again. Using this technique ensures that it's only downloaded when necessary. Probably on my build server, I want to do it all the time, in which case I might flatten this out a little bit. So we were able to scaffold things uh, inside of Visual Studio. We, were also, we also built them by hand, and it really wasn't that hard. But another option that we can do is to come in here to Docker Enterprise. And with Docker Enterprise, we've been using the free community edition so far. Inside here, uh, Docker Enterprise, we can come in here to the new application. Oh, it's not going to let me zoom in. We'll kick off a new application. And now from here, we can do really interesting things. We can choose a template. And I'll choose Linux in this side. And now we can pick from the pre-built applications. So if we want a, a React Express in my SQL application, we grab this one, and it kind of scaffolds out all of the things. If none of these templates work for me, I can switch over here to a custom application, and now I can pick the components that I would like. So I would like an ASP.NET Core site. I would also like a Vue.js front end. And I would also like a Postgres database. So I can pick those particular details that I want. Now I can configure those details. Do what version of view do I want? What ports do I want to expose? And then I push go. Name my app. And that's probably a horrid name. And it will go scaffold out all of those pieces. The ASP.NET Core site, the Angular app, the Docker Compose file, all the Docker files and Docker Ignore files. And now with that application scaffolded out, I can just either fire it up in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, or just say Docker Compose up and launch my stack. We have a bunch of options now on how to scaffold out these uh, projects. 
depending on how much we want to take control over it or how much we want the tooling to do it for us. And then that really, really tight inner loop where we just push debug in Visual Studio and we debug the content in the containers, that is just magic. So you can grab this code from robrich.org, click on presentations, and you'll get straight over to the GitHub. And that was a lot of fun. What are your questions? Um, why would you not run it in a Windows container? Why did I not run it? Why, why, would, you, why would you ever not run it in a Windows container? Why would I ever not run in a Windows container? With a .NET Framework project, I must have a Windows container because that's where .NET Framework runs. .NET Core will run cross-platform, and so now I might start to choose other platforms. If I'm using a Redis cache and that requires Linux containers, or if I want to run in Kubernetes before 1.14, I might do that. And so then I might want to explore other operating systems. That was a great question. Why would I want, want to run in Windows containers? Yeah, if I'm on .NET Core, then a Linux container has less licensing costs, the images are smaller. Um, why would I want to stick with Windows in that case? Maybe I wouldn't. Um, usually server administration. Ops knows how to administer Windows servers, and these aren't, and so that might be a deal breaker. Awesome, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for coming. Thank you.